Hello and welcome to another episode of Dogman Sasquatch Oklahoma Encounters. My name is Lance Hightower, one of the Cryptid Brothers, coming to you from Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's so great to be with you guys again. There's so much to tell. We have been out all over the state investigating. It's been a while, so I do apologize in getting back with you guys. We've been doing a lot of computer website stuff, getting ready for a new website for you guys. I can't wait to tell you. And uh, just doing some different things that some of you have requested to improve some of the things that we wanted to. And uh, we just wanted to kick off 2018. Uh, We're so thankful for you guys and your commitment in listening to us and your kind words and your comments. We appreciate each and every one of you that is a subscriber. So, um, And we want to thank again Wes Gurman with Sasquatch Chronicles uh, helping promote our show. Thank you so much, buddy. We really appreciate that. And from the brothers and Wally Dave, we all appreciate your listening and um, your support. So we're going to forego our uh, recognition of the suburbs, and we're going to start off our first show of 2018 with a doozy here. I have been on pins and needles waiting to tell you this, and I decided to wait on this story until our first episode of uh, January. And um, this is going to be very, very much like the Ohio Bigfoot attack and Fed cover-up. This came to me, um, kind of hot off the press, if you will, from a gentleman I was in contact with way before this story ever broke until he uh, found out about it. And I want to thank him right now. I wish I could give his name. He does not want me to give his name. He was going to tell the story himself. But I'll back up here just a little bit and tell you why. This gentleman um, called me back late last summer and had some interesting things going on in his property. He's in central Florida. He's in a bedroom community about 17 miles from a very, very small town in Florida. And the bedroom community, when I say that, it's really only about four or five neighbors. That's it in his neighborhood. So it is tiny. It is very beautiful where he lives in Central Florida, but um, everything is relatively quiet. You know, nothing ever goes on, but over the last year, he's lived there a few years and nothing's ever happened. Nothing strange has occurred, just normal life, if you will, and everybody just um, taking care of their families and working, etc. And um, probably at the summer, he said, Lance, uh, he called in the toll-free number and he said, there's been some strange things going on. I've got things hitting my trailer. I'm finding some weird footprints. I've had pine cones being thrown at the house late at night. He uh, didn't have any um, window coverings on the windows and he decided to cover the windows up one night and then he had a rock thrown through his patio door and it busted the glass. And uh, there's nobody out there. He said, Lance, I don't know what else it could be. He goes, you know, I it could be some kids. He goes, but we're so far out. We're 17 miles out in the country. The likelihood of that happening is very unlikely. He said, I we're getting some weird sounds. He said, um, I put up some um, motion light detectors on the corner and things have settled down. He came out the next day after putting the motion light up on a corner and it was turned up. And so uh, he surmised it. he's got some Bigfoot activity. And he really didn't share so much of that with some of the neighbors, but he kind of got a feel here and there when to talk to them about it. And his neighbor across the street, just about 50, 60 yards across the street from him, she really doesn't believe in that. She ranks Bigfoot up there with the Easter Bunny. And um, her and her husband are retired. And so she says, oh, that's a bunch of hocus pocus. So he didn't share any more. But... um. This gentleman, and I'll just call him my source since he didn't want to give his name, he basically said that uh, uh, he sent me some audio, he sent me pictures, and the audio he sent me was amazing. He sent me some audio that was actually from another neighbor about three quarters of a mile away from where he lives, and uh, it is uh, about seven minutes of howling of a Bigfoot, of wailing. It's incredible. It really is. And um, it was about 15 minutes of this, he said, that was going on. And in the transfer of the information to me, we lost about eight minutes of it, he said. And so he was only able to give me seven minutes 
of this 15 minute ongoing uh, wailing and howling. It's, it's just incredible. And we're actually going to have that sound on the intro of our website every time. But so we stayed in communication. Um, he gave me these sounds, which I uh, really appreciated. And he always would call, see how I'm doing. I would call him to see how he's doing and uh, with what's going on. And he basically had some questions regarding episode 24 of the gentleman, the cousins that were attacked in the cover up. And, you know, I would talk to him about some things and why. And so he was kind of aware of a lot of things. And as he was asking questions and becoming self enthused and listening to the websites and some of these YouTube radio shows. So that's kind of how we became to know each other. And he was going to give this story in the very beginning, but after listening to episode 24 and what multiple agencies can do to try and shut you up, he he got nervous. And he said that I never thought that this would occur right here in my backyard, Lance. I I'm I'm just not going to do it. I I don't care if you narrate it, but I don't really don't want anyone to recognize my voice. We're only four to five neighbors here in this bedroom community, and I just don't want anybody to recognize and mess with me. I'm retired, and uh, my wife and I, and I, we just want to be left alone and in peace. And I said, I understand. I respect that. So, But I can still tell this story. He said, yes, absolutely. So I tape recorded the conversation so I wouldn't lose any minute detail in this story. So this is what uh, we're going to talk about right now. This occurred in December 10th is when it everything, this story started occurring. So we have a Florida mother that killed a Bigfoot with multiple agency cover-up. And again, this is going to uh, very much reminisce like episode 24, the Ohio Bigfoot attack and cover-up, except in this case, a Bigfoot was killed. And I appreciate uh, this gentleman, again, I'm going to call him my source, for going to the links that he did and seeing some of the things that he saw. He he kind of put himself in a little bit of jeopardy. He did not do it for me. He did it. He's, he's, um, he's a man that's very curious. He has a background in the military. And um, he's just passionate about helping people. So thank you very, very much for passing the story on. I've waited with bated breath trying to get this out here to you guys. So here we go. So what happened, this occurred late Sunday night about 11.30 p.m. on December 10th of 2017, this past year. Uh, My source has a neighbor across the street, again, the disbeliever, and she was out looking for her dog late at night. It wasn't coming in. She normally brings the dog in. So she had a flashlight, and she was walking around just the front of her yard, and she heard some heavy breathing. She turned and with a light, and as she turned, she saw her light shone upon a creature, very large creature, just about 30 to 40 feet away, that was standing behind a sign that wasn't too far from her front yard. And this sign was about three foot off the ground, and at the height of the sign is about five feet, and the width of this sign is about four feet wide. So she saw this thing was actually had a hand underneath the sign and was kind of gripping it. And the other hand was kind of on top of the sign. Well, she freaked. She saw this thing and she ran back in the house and she was telling her husband who can't hear very well. And so he was just saying, uh, they were arguing basically, you didn't see anything. You saw a bear. She said, the hell I did. I know what I saw. You just need to, um, you know, hear what I'm telling you. So basically, basically, She called my source, her neighbor across the street, and she said, come quickly, come quickly and bring a gun. So he knew something was up. So he got a gun, he ran across the street, and the neighbor began to tell my source what she had seen in trying to find her dog. And he said, "Uh uh-huh. She said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I doubted you. I didn't think these things were real. I saw it, I saw it. And he goes, it's okay, it's okay, just calm down. So she calmed down a little bit, and he said, let's go find your dog. So there was a shed out back of her house. And they looked in the shed. And in the shed, there was a workbench. And under the workbench was that dog. He was way back in the corner. So he wouldn't come out. So my source grabbed the collar of this dog and pulled it out. Reluctantly, the dog finally came out. 
they brought the dog in the neighbor's house and she was still kind of frantic. The husband was arguing with his wife. You didn't see anything but a damn bear. And she said, I did not. And so they were going back and forth. And so my source was trying to calm both of them down. And finally, after a while, they calmed down. Well, he was going to see himself out the door and she was walking him out the door about 12.45 a.m. And as they were walking out the door, a sheriff's car sped past with lights on. And then a game warden, Florida game warden car or an SUV truck sped past as well with lights on. And they saw that they were down at the end. Of, they went down to the end of the street about 150 yards to a neighbor's house that just moved in. We'll call them a, the new neighbor. They moved in about four months ago. It was a mother, a single mother with three girls. And that these two cars with lights on went down. And my source and his neighbor from across the street looked at each other and said, uh, let's go down and see what's going on. So as they were walking out the, her door and opening her gate to go down the street, two more cars went by. Uh, a sheriff SUV car with lights on and a Florida game warden, uh, another truck went by. So now there's four cars down there with lights on. So as they were walking down to the new neighbor's house, my source said, as he approached one of the sheriff's cars, he saw the mother. He recognized the mother, and she was in the back seat, and she was handcuffed. And he's thinking to himself, what the hell's going on? So he walked up. He saw a game warden on the porch talking to the girls, or a one of the middle girls. And so he approached the game warden and with his neighbor, and he said, uh, uh, excuse me, sir, what, what, what's going on here? He goes, uh, and the game warden said, who are you? He said, uh, well, I'm, we're the neighbors down the street, and uh, nothing ever goes on like this around here. So what, what's going on, if I may ask? He said, well, this mother uh, discharged, a firearm, uh, discharged a firearm unlawfully and shot a bear. And he said, really? About that time, that middle-aged girl that was in grade school said, no, mommy, mommy shot a monster. Mommy shot a monster. And the game warden looked down at her and he said, you need to go inside the house with your sisters. So my source and his neighbor from across the street both looked at each other, kind of, uh-huh, mm-hmm. So the game warden said, there's nothing to see here, sir. Just You need to just go back home. So they turned away, walked back to their homes. And my source uh, saw his neighbor off at her house and he walked back across the street to his after about 10 minutes or so, he waited in the, the four of the cars, the two game warden trucks and the two sheriff SUV cars drove past and there was nobody there at the new neighbor's place, but he knew that the girls were still there. So he walked back down the street, knocked on the door and uh, basically said, uh, girls, I'm sure you're shook up. Uh, do you just want to come stay with me and my wife? Well, you stay the night and uh, we'll feed you breakfast in the morning and then you can leave. So the girls said, yes, yes, we want to go, yes. So he got the girls, and um, they all went back down to, to um, his house where his wife um, and him live, and uh, they basically uh, stayed the night there. So then, as they got into his house, as he was kind of feeding the girls, as they were bedding down, and uh, the one of the girls said, Mommy, Mommy didn't shoot a bear. She shot a monster. It was a monster. My source was just kind of, huh, I wonder if um, it was a Bigfoot, is what he was kind of asking himself. He still didn't know the specifics of what was going on. And so um, so once the girls were settling down and um, they were getting ready to um, go to bed, he decided to, my source decided to sneak out his back door of his house, kind of in the dark, and he walked around to the back side of the property of the new neighbor's house. Again, it was about 150 yards. He walked in the woods, walked down, and came from and approached the back side of the property to about 40 feet from her trailer. And what he did is he squatted down in the tree line, which was only about 10, probably, actually he said about 15 feet. 20 feet into the tree line, which was still about 40 feet from her trailer. So 
if you can imagine what he was telling me, there's about 15 feet to uh, 20 feet of trees, and then it is a mowed area. It's clear, and then it's her trailer. So as he squatted down in the wood line there, he was trying to get a good position, but where no one could see him, he thought, I'm just going to sit right here if someone, just see what goes on. And he's and it was, he couldn't see much because it was dark, but he could see that she had a nightlight out in front of her house, but it cast a shadow to the back of uh, her trailer. So he was squatted down, he got behind a tree, and he just kind of stuck his head out, and he was just kind of watching and waiting. And within a few minutes, a few minutes of just squatting down, he said, here comes a, um, a game warden truck. He could tell, and I asked him, how, do, how can you tell? And he said it had the emblem right on the door, Florida Game uh, Wildlife Department, and it had their emblem right there. He said it was a quad cab, and it had a, like a short bed in it, um, a truck is what it was. And it backed in. And then there was two other trucks that came that just pulled in with their with their lights. And then they shut their lights off. Mm-hmm. And the quad cab, uh, all three of the trucks were Florida um, wildlife game trucks. And the quad cab that backed in was shining lights. You know, it had its reverse lights. And he says, when it had those lights, I could see clearly then that there was a body laying on that cleared area, that mowed area back behind her um, her, uh, her house right there. And it was, uh, you could see that the feet were sticking up. And he said, you could clearly see the, the arms. And it was sprawled out right on the ground. He said, uh, I asked him, I said, what could you tell size? He said, you can just tell it was big. He said, at least from the ground to the chest area that I could gauge, it was at least two and a half to three foot thick, at least. He said it pulled in, that truck pulled in with probably about 10 feet from that Bigfoot, and it stopped. They turned off the trucks, and out of the quad cab, three game wardens got out. And I asked him, I said, how do you know it was a game warden? He says, well, they were all wearing the same uniform. There was the quad cab that backed up, had three guys get out. They all had the same uniform, and they had the game warden badge. And then out of the other two game warden trucks was a single game warden that got out of those trucks. So there was a total of five of them. And they all were wearing the uniform and had the guns on the side and everything. He said they had flashlights and they were they had flashlights down on the Bigfoot and they were looking at it. He said they were saying something, but I couldn't quite hear what they were saying because everything was kind of like a, a, a almost like a whisper. You could hear them talking, but I couldn't discern what they were saying. And so one of the, one of the game wardens um, opened the tailgate to the quad cab truck and um, he had one of those roll away. He said, Lance, it's one of those roll away. It, it's like a, um, it locks in, it, it goes in tracks. It, it can, you know, so you don't have your stuff stolen out of the back of the um, uh, truck bed and it's on a track and it basically locks your stuff up that's in the back of your um, bed of your truck. And I said, oh, I think I know. And he said it, they pushed it open. He slid it open. And then I uh, got back down. And then they started to lift this Bigfoot. And I said, did they have a net? Did, what, what, did, what did it look like? He said, well, he said they just were manhandling it. He said they had an arm. They had the legs. And one guy had like the head. And he said, you can tell they were struggling. When they tried to lift it up, It was they were struggling. They almost dropped it. And they were, you could tell they were straining. And then finally, what they did is they loaded it head first on its back. And then they pushed it up in the truck bed. And uh, one guy was up in the truck bed and they, they grabbed onto the arms and they pulled it up as the others were on the ground pushing kind of the legs and feet. And they finally got it loaded and they pushed the feet in and kind of bent a little bit uh, at the knee. And they shut the truck bed. And then they, the two guys are in, got out, and then they took the uh, truck liner that's in that the, the lockaway liner. They rolled it, in, and then they locked it, so you couldn't see anything from the top. It's just locked in, and everybody got in their respective trucks, and they left. And I said, he said they were there, and they were got their business done. They were in and out within less than fifteen minutes. So he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He just couldn't believe it. And so he got up, my source got up, he walked back through the woods, 
and came in the back side of his property and got went back into his home. And that was it at that point in time. The girls were sleeping. Everybody was asleep at his house. And so at that point in time, he went to bed. The next morning, well, earlier that day, so it's already, that was Sunday, early, early. Uh, Sunday's when this started. And that was already, when he was watching these game wardens, that was already early, early in the morning uh, of Monday, uh, December 11th. So what he did, he got up. The girls got up relatively early uh, that morning. Uh, two of the girls had to go to school. School was still in session. And so he fed them, and the girls walked over to their place to get ready for school. And the oldest was helping the sisters. And um, so they left back to their house. And within about seven to ten minutes, my source said he gets a knock at his door. And this was about 9 a.m. again on Monday, December 11th. He gets a knock on the door about 9. He answers, and there was two guys standing at the doorstep. And one guy was in a black suit, clean cut, and the other guy was kind of dressed casual with a light, scruffy beard. A little bit larger than the clean cut guy in the suit. And uh, he noticed they had pulled up in a black car. And they really didn't introduce themselves at all. They just said, good morning. Uh, We heard that you and your neighbors were down the street last night at the neighbor's house. He said, yeah, we were down there because nothing like this ever happens around here. And we wanted to know what was going on. And uh, it's typically dead around here. So we were just curious what was happening. So this... uh, We'll call this guy the men in black guy because he was kind of in a black car and he was in a black suit. He said, uh, do you know what happened? And my source said, well, all I know is that a woman discharged a gun and supposedly shot a bear. And the uh, men in black guy said, he said, yes, that's what we were told too. And he said, do you, have you heard of anything else that was said? And my source thought, this is interesting, but he did you know, he was just thinking this. He said, no, nothing else that I'm aware of. And um, he said, well, if we want to get in touch with you, how do we contact you, sir? And my source said, well, I'll be right here. I ain't going nowhere. I've been here a long time. So that was all that was said. And they got back into their car. And as they were pulling away, my source said he noticed that it had government tags. And then they just left. And they didn't go to anyone's home. They were just at his home that they noticed. And they left down the street. So later that day, my source said that he had to go to the store to get some groceries for him and his wife. And he was stopped while he was going to the grocery store. He was pulled over by a local deputy sheriff while driving into town. And he always drives the speed limit, he said. He goes, I never break the speed limit law. He goes, what? He goes, I'm driving the speed limit way under. It's like, you know, 35 miles an hour. I'm doing 30. And then uh, he gets pulled over, and he knew he hadn't been speeding. And so when he got pulled over, the deputy came up to the window, and he said, uh, uh, Why did you pull me over? I wasn't speeding. And the deputy said, Yes, you're right, but I pulled you over because you have a back light out. And so my source got and walked around the back of his car, and he said, Where? I don't have any lights out. He's thinking taillights. He said, Both of my taillights work. He said, No. The deputy said, Right there. You have a light out. Uh, over your license plate. Well, there was two little bulbs that light up the license plate. One was on and one was out. And my source said, that's a tiny light bulb. One is still on. I still have one that's still uh, lit. And the deputy said, you'll still have to get that fixed, sir. So my source got back into the car and kind of held his tongue. He said, thank you, sir. Have a nice day. I appreciate it. I'll get it fixed. And he went on to the grocery store. And he's thinking to himself, what the hell? Why would, there's something's not driving here. And so he got his grocery shopping done and he put the groceries in. And he, as he was driving away from the grocery store, he noticed immediately that he was being followed by a sheriff's car in an SUV. And the sheriff tailgated, literally tailgated him all through town and all the way back to his home 17 miles away. 
He said, Lance, he was so close. He was like six feet at some times from my back bumper. If I would have barely touched my brake, he would have rammed me. He said, after a while, it was starting to really piss me off. He said, I thought, honestly, he was going to hit me a few times. I almost stopped and just said, what the hell are you doing? He goes, but I held my tongue. I didn't say anything. I didn't give any hand gestures. I just kind of looked straight ahead as if he was not back there the whole time. But obviously, this at this point now being pulled over, now I'm being tailgated by a sheriff. This has got to be some type of intimidation tactic or something. I don't know what they're up to. They must think I know something that I'm not supposed to. I don't know, but this is absurd. So they must think I know something. So they tailgated, this deputy sheriff tailgated me, he said, all the way to my house. I pulled into my drive, and then he just kept going straight. He never stopped. He just kept going straight and kept going on. Never said anything, just kept going straight. And I, I thought, they must think I know something about this Bigfoot killing. They, know, they don't know what I know, but they're just trying to see. And if I'll crack or break, I don't know. This is bizarre. So this sheriff's car went straight on, never pulled away. So that was Monday, December 11th. Now, Tuesday, December 12th. And again, my source was just telling me day by day what was going on. He had called me and said, Lance, you got it. this is what happened yesterday. Lance, this is what happened again later today. So I was documenting all this as he was calling me. So this is Tuesday, December 12th, 2017. He said, it's morning time. It's about 930. And my source had a knock at the door. And he opened the door. And there were two guys, different guys, um, than the day before that knocked on his door that had government tags. And these two guys were driving a black Lincoln like car like some type of Crown Victoria or Lincoln, and it too had government tags. Now, these guys were different. They were both uh, pretty clean cut, about the same height, uh, average height. They were not in suits. They were just kind of casually dressed, and they basically asked my source what the first two guys had asked the day before. And my source said, well, as far as I'm aware of, the neighbor lady down the street discharged a gun and shot a bear illegally. And one of the guys said, well, are you sure that's all you heard? And my source said, yes, that's what I told the other two guys that I spoke to yesterday that was here. So they left. These two guys got back into their car, turned around. And again, he noticed that they had government tags as well and drove off. And they were only there for about five minutes or so, he said. They didn't drive to any other neighbor homes that he could tell. Um, they may have, but they didn't drive anywhere else after they left his driveway. They went on. And he told me, I, when I asked him, I said, what do you think they're there? And he says, well, I think they were there visiting me twice because they knew that the girls stayed the night with him and his wife. And they were trying to see how much information that the girls divulged to him about what had occurred about their mother shooting a Bigfoot. I'm sure that's what it was. And I concurred after, you know, discussing this with him. So he said later that day in the afternoon, my source got a call from a neighbor, a buddy of his, and we'll call his neighbor, Neighbor One. He owns, uh, Neighbor One owns quite a bit of property in that area, and uh, he couldn't find one of his dogs, and was wanting to know if my source would go with him and help him. And my source said, of course, yeah, uh, give me a second, let me get things tied up here, and I'll help you. And also, this uh, neighbor... Um, guy contacted another neighbor, and we'll call him neighbor number two, who also owns property that abuts up against neighbor one's property. Neighbor one has quite a bit, like 120 acres. Neighbor two has about like 30 acres, but they abut up against each other's property. So neighbor one said, hey, when I come with us, I'm going to look for my dog. Neighbor two said, yeah, I'll go well. I'll go, I'll go with you guys. So my source also knew neighbor one didn't have a gun, so he brought a gun for him, and he had a gun. So, you know, he says, anytime you go anywhere, everybody needs to carry a gun. So he said, we went. So all three of these neighbors, which included my source, set out to walk on neighbor one's property looking for neighbor one's dog. And they, and, and all this property was behind neighbor one's um, house. The entrance to the property actually is very close to neighbor one's house, and he has about 120 acres, like I said. 
and that's the gate to get in and get out. My source said no sooner had they began had begun to walk on two neighbor the neighbor's woods, only about 50 to 60 yards in the woods as they were walking, and they heard something at first, and then they turned and they saw, all three of them saw military soldiers with firearms walking slowly in neighbor's one, neighbor one's woods. And my source said that there was about 10 soldiers. They were in fatigues, and they had their helmets on, and they were all carrying AR-15s. And I said, how do you know they were AR-15s? He said, well, I'm, I've been in the military. I have military experience. I, I know what things are. He said that neighbor one uh, approached one of the soldiers who was kind of a breaking away from the group to approach him. And neighbor one said, uh, what are you guys doing on my property? Because neighbor one has his property posted everywhere. No hunting, no fishing. Because all of the livestock he has around his property, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want anyone to come in there and uh, mess with his livestock or his land. And the soldier came forward was a sergeant, and he said, uh, and he could tell from the patch it was a sergeant. And he said, "We're conducting a military exercise, sir." And neighbor was, and neighbor one said, "Not on my property. No one gave anybody authority to do that." And the sergeant said, "We can go anywhere we want, sir." And neighbor one said, who's in charge here? So the sergeant said, my lieutenant, who was up a little ways and came walking forward to neighbor one. He can see that he was talking to the sergeant. And he stepped up. And this uh, lieutenant was a young guy, my source said. He was probably about somewhere around 24, 25 in age. And uh, he basically said he was a kind of a cocky ass, is what he said. And he spoke to my neighbor and said, he looked at neighbor one and he said, you either get off the property now or we'll have to remove, remove you from the property immediately. Then neighbor one said, who is your commander? And the lieutenant didn't say a word. He said, we will remove you if you do not leave now, sir. Now, what was very interesting, my source said, is that while they were talking to this military personnel standing there about 50 or 60 feet into neighbor one's wood line, some of the military, uh, there was a military-like helicopter flying overhead and through neighbor one's woods. He states that it was like a two-seater type of small helo that was all black with the open doors and that there were no numbers or letters, no identification on the side of this helicopter, but it had a large black dome under the belly of the helo. And my source said it reminded him back when he was uh, in the military, like a heat-seeking or thermal detection device. It's like a big bulb mounted on the bottom, and it too was kind of like a tinted black. He said, I'm sure of it. I'm sure that it was some type of a thermal device, heat-seeking device. With my military experience, that's what we used to have too. And he said they were flying all over the property when they were talking to this um, sergeant and lieutenant. So... They agreed that the military was in uh, some type of operation of locating, eliminating, and extracting any remaining Bigfoots in the area on neighbor one's property. And that my source said to neighbor one, he said, we just, let's just go. Let's, let's just go. Just, just, I'll, I'll tell you about what's going on. So they left, walking back to neighbor one's home. And neighbor one said, I don't know how the hell they got onto my property when the main entrance is right by my house. And my source said, I guarantee you that they're coming in somewhere on the back side of the property through that abandoned state park area. Behind neighbor one and behind partly of neighbor two's property is an abandoned state park that's been fenced in and gated in. It's absolutely off to the public. There's nobody going in. It's been closed off to the public for a long time, my source says. He said, I bet you they're coming through your property through that abandoned state park, through the back way or something. So when they got up back to neighbor one's house, my, or, my source asked neighbor two if he could walk to the back of his property to take a closer look and see if he could see anything fishy, what was going on. And neighbor two, neighbor two said, sure. So my source took off slowly, walking carefully, staying out of the line of sight, walking near a high dirt embankment, which was about, he said, about 18 feet in height, 
while being concealed in the swamp weeds. He said that he walked all the way to the far east end of neighbor two's property, as far away as to not be seen by anyone, if there was anyone back there. On top of this eight-foot embankment, he said that there was a wooden fence with about four-by-four posts and one-by-sixes across the top, and it was white. As soon as he reached the back end of Neighbor 2's property, he waited for about, he said, 20 to 30 minutes by laying down in the weeds and just kind of waiting. And no sooner than about that 20 to 30 minutes, and there was two vehicles that pulled through a fenced gate from the abandoned state park, which adjoined neighbor one's property. One vehicle was black Econo van, he said, with with not many windows, but it did have some, some small windows in the back that were tinted. But the window where the driver and passenger was at was not tinted. And the other vehicle that followed was a black SUV with dark tinted windows all the way around. So... My source knew, he said, he goes, this is where they're coming in to neighbor one's property right here. I knew it. Then he went back to call neighbor one and uh, where they had come in at. And as he was speaking to neighbor one over the land phone, they both agreed to hang up and talk over their cell phones instead. So my source said they discussed that if anybody could be listening on their landlines, it would be more challenging and they thought difficult to do cell phones. So they hung up and they called back and spoke on their cell phones to discuss the matter, what was going on on the back of uh, neighbor one's property. And so that ended Tuesday, December 12th events. So Wednesday, December 13th, 2017, my source gets a call from neighbor two and said that late last night that it sounded like a war zone at the back of his property. My source said that he didn't hear anything, probably because he can't hear much when the doors and the windows are shut. And he also asked neighbor one if he had heard anything, and he said no. But he thought that very, very strange that he heard all these guns going off late at night. Pow, 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 pow. And so later, my source said that later that morning... He saw the oldest daughter walking down the road, taking her little sisters to the bus stop. And my source asked uh, the daughter, he decided to uh, go down there. He said, how's everything going, hon? And the girl said, I don't want to talk about it. My mother said that I'm not supposed to talk about what happened. My source said, okay, okay, no problem, no problem. I understand, but how's your mother doing? And the daughter said, oh, uh, she's doing okay. She's home sleeping right now. I asked him who he thought may have spoken to the girls and why they seemed a little anxious because they, they appeared that way when my source was telling me. And he said, well, I'm sure the mother's mother definitely talked to them, but who talked to her? Most likely the guys in black, he said. My source said that the oldest daughter was trying to get her mom out of jail and needed some assistance later that day. So my source helped the oldest daughter in getting the mother released to go back home which did happen later that day, about three to four hours later. He said that the oldest daughter did say, though, that they were outside of that night, which would have been Sunday night. They were out playing. All three were out playing till about 11 p.m. And then they went back inside. Shortly after, their mother pulled up, and that's when they heard shots from their mother's pistol. They went outside and saw what she had shot. So this is when the oldest daughter went back in the house immediately and called the sheriff's department to tell their mo- to tell what their mother had shot. Of course, the girls and the mother did not expect that the mother would be arrested and jailed from this incident. So when my source and I spoke about this, this is where basically people need to be aware of. The first people that you call is not a sheriff, is not a game warden. And we'll get into who you need to call later here. So let's continue on. I asked how much of a bond that the court set to my source of this mother being jailed. And he said it was a ridiculous amount. It's more than it should have been, Lance. Again, most likely a potential tactic in trying to show how serious they are. They being the men in black, I guess, or this agency, this Fed agency, on wanting things kept quiet and what they can do. I told my source source that they most likely took her pistol 
and they may have even confiscated her phone, which she won't get back, I'm sure, and we both agreed. And I asked my source, has he seen the mother out and about, being that she's out of jail? And he said, yes, I've seen her. She's, um, she, you know, she leaves and then she comes back from work, but hasn't spoken to her. She just goes to work and comes home, goes to work and comes home. Also, later that same day, my source had gone into town later, and so he decided to, uh, before he was going to drive into town, he decided to drive down by the new neighbor, the late, the mother that shot the Bigfoot, to go, there's a loop down there, so he decided to go past her house and loop around, then go back as uh, he was going into town, just to see anything going on at her place, or, you know, just to kind of uh, see what's going on. And so as he drove down the street to the new neighbor's house, as he was driving past the house, just before he uh, did a U-turn, as he drove past, he noticed that in the back of her trailer, there was a black SUV with government plates right there because they were pulled in and he could easily see the plates and that there was two men in the near the back door of her place. One of the guys had a rake and uh, where the dead Bigfoot was found dead and where he was not too far away in the woods. We both believe that they were there picking up any remaining evidence of dried blood, collecting any tissue specimens from the shooting, and erasing any evidence or tracks, basically wiping the area clean of any evidence of what transpired during the early hours of that previous Monday. So it was kind of crazy when he told me. I just couldn't believe it, but I could believe it. So they were basically wiping the area clean checking for any uh, blood smears on the trailer, any evidence, collecting everything, so as if nothing ever occurred. So Thursday came, December 14th. My source contacted me and he said, "Um, Lance, there's nothing going on today. Everything seems to be just like it was prior to everything just uh, uh, going crazy on Sunday. He said, everything is quiet. There's no black SUVs. There's no one knocking on doors. There's no military. There's nothing. There's no helicopters. It's just quiet now. So we spent hours and hours talking about this and reviewing what happened and why. So in listening to this, I basically said, you know, this is exactly what happened during the Ohio Bigfoot. He said, yeah, I can't believe this, Lance. He said, I never thought in a million years it would occur something like that here. And I said, well, you never know where and you never know when. I said, but the problem that people have is when they contact people of authority thinking they're going to help them. And what happens is they end up being crucified. They end up being sent to jail, ridiculed, embarrassed, threatened, and they did nothing wrong. They thought they were doing something right by contacting the quote-unquote appropriate officials. So after all this and in speaking to my source, and we still talk on a weekly basis, I thought about this and said, what can anyone learn from this Bigfoot shooting? This obvious local law enforcement, wildlife department, federal department, and military cover-up involving four different agencies. This is crazy. There's people that know out there, but they want to cover things up. Why? Well, I think it's quite simple. I think that they want to cover it up because they're afraid it would cause mass panic, and I can see that. I think they want to cover it up because you can have loss of dollars. I think that's the primary loss of revenue. Again, we spoke about this on episode 24, and I've heard this said on Sasquatch Chronicles and Bigfoot Outlaws and uh, Brenton Sawn show that can you imagine the billions of dollars that will be lost from people not camping, hunting, hiking, boating, fishing, on and on and on if there was a relic hominoid creature among the woods and how people would not go and then you'd have people go with pitchforks. I mean, there would be such a variety of people that would stay away from the woods and those that would go into the woods. You would have people from PETA wanting to say everything is protected then across the United States. Nothing, you can't hunt anywhere if these things are out there. So it would cause a mass chaotic Pandora's box, if you will, of lost revenue 
have so many federal laws, wildlife laws. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on of potential. Um, there's a really good book out there that I just started. It's been out there for a long time. My brother Bill started getting me on it, and it goes through some scenarios out there. It's called Enoch by Autumn Williams. Very good book. I would read that because in the very beginning, she goes through a potential scenario that I think it could be quite true on what could happen on something like that. So I want to say here in closing just a little bit is first, if you ever shoot down or kill a Bigfoot or a Dogman or become injured from a Bigfoot or Dogman attack, what should you do? Well, first of all, you shouldn't call any law enforcement authorities. Not unless you have a dire emergency, health-related, uh, your life is in jeopardy, or others that are seriously injured. Honestly, if, if, uh, so what does that constitute? Well, that's going to be on a person to person basis here, but if, uh, your life's not in jeopardy and you've, um, and this is just my opinion, if you were pushed or you have a laceration and you're going to make it, then you really shouldn't, or I wouldn't call the authorities. Why? Because the people who you think again, that are going to help you, that are going to be the very ones who, as I said before, crucify you and sending you to jail. They will intimidate you. They will coerce you and tell you to keep your trap shut, plain and simple. So unfortunately, if these good folks who have the first time encounter and have never listened to any shows like ours and others, they're going to call the local law enforcement or they're going to call the county game warden. Either one is not a smart idea. It's just not. I know that sounds crazy to say, but it's not in this particular circumstances. So what should someone do if they shoot a Bigfoot or a Dogman, something? And so how would you know that? It's just going to look different like you've never seen before. It's not a dog. It's not a cow. It's not a mountain lion. You'll know. I'll just say you'll know. And if there's no one injured, who do you call? Call us. Give us a call on our toll-free number, and we'll come and assist you with taking care of what needs to happen. That's all I'll say. But realize there'll have to be some strict confidentiality between us, both on your end and, of course, on our end. If you wish, you don't have to give us your name. On a most recent update from my source, he said that the mother and her girls have recently moved away. The mother said that it was because of her getting married. But we both suspected that it was because of what occurred that they were afraid to remain there any longer and they didn't want to be around that area and I can't blame them one bit really both of us couldn't so in wrapping this up and in closing here I really want to give my source a thank you and that uh, just sharing this bizarre encounter that happened he couldn't believe it was happening every day was something bizarre he couldn't believe it it was just it was like a CSI type of movie. He was scared. It was it was thrilling at first, but then he got scared. He said, I, I don't want anybody to mess with me, Lance. And I said, well, and he was concerned about people listening to our conversations. And so we delayed the story in getting out for a couple reasons. One, we didn't, while it was hot, we didn't want anyone that happens to get on these shows to find out and find out who he was. We wanted to let everything die down just a little bit, and I decided to go ahead and hang on to it to start our shows for 2018. That's the reason why. And again, this occurred in Central Florida. He's in a bedroom community. He asked that I not, at this present time, give it, because really, there's only like four or five people in this bedroom community. He said it's terribly small, and you would know who I am if I was to give um, the people or my name in this area. He said that he would, uh, again, love to have done this himself, but after hearing of the events that transpired from episode 24, the cousins that were attacked with the Fed intimidation, the cover-up and everything, he didn't trust that uh, some of the men in black wouldn't try to find him later. And uh, after telling me and airing the story of events, and he really didn't want that at all. He said, I'm retired. I just want to be left alone in peace and not bothered, Lance. And I said, I respect that. I'll, I'll make sure no one knows who you are. So to everyone that's listening to many of these YouTube radio shows, what we can all learn is straightforward and to the point. 
don't trust any law enforcement or game department agencies. If you tell them anything regarding a Bigfoot story, a Bigfoot or a dogman shooting that occurred, just don't say anything. And again, if you have shot some creature that you know isn't human and it's not anything that you've ever seen before, give us a call and we can ease your worries. We can. We've already helped many folks across the state and outside of the state, and we can help you as well. So thanks everyone for listening to yet another cryptid encounter and ensuing cover-up. We feel um, very honored to be receiving such amazing stories from you, our listeners, who are really the courageous ones who have experienced something so terrifying, yet you're still brave enough to share with us that we can share to you guys. So thank you guys so very much. Again, we feel blessed that you that we could help this gentleman share what had happened. So many of you that are just out there that have had very similar encounters can share what happened to you so others can feel you're not alone. Because there are literally thousands of people, in our opinion, that have had very similar circumstances and encounters and stories just like this that really happened. They really happened. And I know they're so far-fetched that many people will say, that can't happen, that didn't happen. I'm telling you right now, folks, it did. And it, it has occurred all the time. It occurs every month somewhere in the United States. And there's just a handful of people that will speak up. So we appreciate this gentleman, my source. I talk to him on a continuous basis. I still talk to the gentleman um, in Ohio on a continuous basis. We're good friends and it's about relationships. It's about trust and they trust me and I trust them. So to everyone out there, stay safe, stay safe. When you're going out investigating, take care of each other, never go alone and always stay alert. We are Cryptid Brothers Investigation of Oklahoma. Tell-